Welcome to What the Heck's Your Source for Warhammer Underworlds and Under 30 Magenta Wrap Gifts for Second Christmas. I'm your co-host, Davey. And with me, I have the newly rewritten co-host, Skylar. How are you, Skylar? <laughs> newly rewritten? <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> and and Brian, also errated. What's up, what's up? I'm fully clarified. <laughs> We're coming to you on January 8th. We're recording an episode, if you figured it out from our intro, we're covering the Errata FAQ and uh, document updates that dropped, I think, just about a week ago, uh, just a little bit more than a week ago. By the time you hear this, it'll have been uh, two weeks, and uh, we've had a chance to see their effect in the wild now. We're, we're going to cover some of the the biggest highlights. Um, for other context, uh, Stab Lads and Malevolent Masks are almost out to the general public uh, and that's going to be pretty fun to see them roaming around i am excited for those mad scientist mask builds uh, to really get out and about and uh boys we're heading to lvo in just over a week so yikes um and then the other thing is uh, adepticon registration has opened that's uh, our event and uh as as we were hoping we did we have seen an official gw event too so those are both available to sign up for yep got my registration squared away excellent uh i'm gonna probably stick with tradition and wait too long and panic when i uh can't get to, into anything so better better served served me well in the past our topic for the day is that errata faq uh and we'll have some broad thoughts about uh, the championship format, the far list, of course, as well. Uh, Skyler, before we get that, we're going to do some community shout outs. I know you've been uh, instrumental into uh, bringing one fella here. We want to give him a shout out. You want to uh, talk about uh, old chop here? Absolutely. So Chop is newer to our local uh, towards the end of the year, but he has made a big impact to our local since his arrival. Uh, he is um, a self-stated um, hype man, um, <laughs> but he backs that up with enthusiasm and all of um, like his great network of, of people that he games with and uh, enjoys sharing games with. So he's been enjoying sharing Underworlds uh, with them in our local, but not just uh, to our local. Chop also has a podcast called Three Men and a War Game and a Discord uh, that hosts this community that he's built around his podcast. Again, Three Men and a War Game and uh, has released an episode uh, pitching Underworlds to other war gamers and listeners of his podcast. So um, if you're looking to get somebody into Underworlds, you have now two episodes uh, to pitch Underworlds to them. I'm sure there's there's more as well, uh, but this is one that you can add uh, to your toolkit. You can uh, see you know, if you feel that the episode that we have uh, is a good one for uh, introducing a friend, or if you think uh, the Three Men in a War Game podcast might uh, hit the particular notes uh, that you'd like a friend to hear, uh, definitely uh, give that a listen. See if that's something that you want to add to that toolkit. Yeah, that's something coming from a perspective of somebody who's covering a, a broader spectrum of games, which is uh, which is cool. It's got some good value. Uh, Chop Chop has called his shot. I think he said when he uh, got in with us, he was. He's like, I'm, I'm going to play. And I'm going to bring five people with me. And uh, he's almost delivered on that promise, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think he was like, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to drop an episode and we're going to add four more people to your local. <laughs> and he has been on it. Um, yeah. It's It's been awesome seeing uh, the growth of our local uh, continue. And yeah. actually, on that note. Uh, we started uh, the first league of 2024. It just kicked off this last Thursday, and I'm super enthusiastic. We had 16 people uh, there for the kickoff night, uh, and we had additional individuals, uh, two additional individuals, grabbing matches outside of Thursday night that couldn't make it. Uh, so that nets out to we already have 14 competitors looking to be in it uh, for the full eight-week stretch and another four people uh, that are uh, what we affectionately call cameos. Uh, yeah. They interact with the league, they show up, uh, they're a part of our community, and we're happy to have them uh, over the course of the league, and you can still still grab games with them. Um, so 18 people, you know, essentially interacting with our, our weekly Underworlds scene. Uh, 
it feels feels great. Yeah, pretty awesome. Uh, I want to continue our standard tradition of shouting out the Spent Glory uh, blog. This is uh, a, one that's particularly relevant to us who are getting ready to launch into LVO. And uh, we are seeing some messages from folks on on our boards, you know, saying, hey, I, I'm going to be going to Adepticon for the first time or I'll be doing my first event. And I think we generally consider that Spent Glory is kind of the resource for new players. Uh, it, it's more than that. It's for more than just new players, but uh, that, that is our, my easiest recommendation. If somebody says I'm, I'm brand new, like we we've done some stuff and we will point you to what we've done, but, but that's a real comprehensive one. And, uh, most recently is a, a participating in your first tournament. And it's all about kind of all the things that come around, like in and around the games themselves. Uh, and I, uh, I think it's actually a valuable resource for someone who has been to more than one. Uh, I was kind of reading through it here just a little bit ago and I'm seeing reminders. That I'm like, Oh, that's, you know, they're talking about the mindset and all that sort of thing. Like these are all really good things to keep in mind. So I'd actually recommend it for anybody headed to a tournament, whether it's your first or your first in a long time. Uh, I think there's some really valuable stuff there. Uh, as always, it's kind of top notch content that, uh, that spent glory puts out there. Yeah. It's like really helps accelerate through the early learning curve. Even if you missed a step, you realize you go back, you're like, Oh, I've been doing this wrong. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Brian, you got anything you want to cover? Uh, yeah, I wanted to shout out uh, Tris and the Austrian Masters. Uh, there was a 20-player tournament over in Austria. Uh, it sounds like the Vienna scene. And it was a championship event with a top eight cut. They played four games day one and then three games on the second day. Uh, and the champions from that seem to be number one was Sepulchral Guard from Goro, who I think Ooh. is an Italian player. I think I remember from WTC. Yep. So I think the Italians went and robbed uh, the Austrians. I don't know if there were any tickets here. I don't know if this was a qualifier event. I don't know if we got those details. But then in second place, we have Darth Vanzer with Hexbane's Hunters. Also Third Italian place. is my understanding. I think the oh. it, it was an all Italian final from what I was seeing. So Ooh. I mean, it makes sense. Everyone always says that Italy is the Canada of Europe. So is it? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm just making that up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Third and fourth. And uh, third, we've got Vintrov with Sirenized Razors once again. Pop yeah. Up. Excellent. Uh, and, and fourth core chosen. Yeah. Oh, right. fourth was core chosen. It's not listed <laughs> yeah. here. I don't have notes. <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a championship event. So I think uh, it looked like everybody was thrilled with what we're going to talk about today and yeah. how the FAR has kind of shaken things up. Yeah. And uh, the meta has been shook and the viability of warbands has been revitalized. So it's yeah. awesome to see. I specifically in that circumstance want to um, shout out sort of thank Tris for uh, hyping that event and uh, getting on the different channels and making sure people knew it was happening. Um, I, I, there's, there's folks who want to be champions, you know, want to be proponents of that championship format. And that, that was a real positive way he did it. It was to kind of highlight, highlight an event and highlight the health of, of that uh, format at this time. Yeah. Agreed. And major shout out Tris. Yeah, and a, a tag along shout out. Like, I don't know hardly any details about this, but there was uh, some call outs to see if America would be sending a team to the oh, uh, yeah. World Team Champion uh, or tournament. I have I don't know any details about this, but I, it's one where I have vacation time to burn. So it's a five man team tournament. Sounds like yeah. Uh, so if there's people interested, th- start the chatter. Yeah. I, uh, I could go, but I need teammates. I'm gonna go. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna like uh, Bobby Fisher. It run like five games at the same time. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> uh, Skyler, do you have anything else you want to shout out before we move on? Yeah, one last shout out for today, uh, and extremely topic relevant. Uh, there is a new resource, uh, and this is Underworlds Dash FAQ dot info. Uh, with all these shout outs, um, if there's any links uh, or anything like that, we're going to have them in the show notes. Uh, but what Underworlds FAQ.info is, is an easy to search, all in one place FAQ resource. Uh, and this has been brought about uh, by an individual with a Discord handle of uh, Rob 
Sparky with a four in there. Uh, so uh, going to go out on the limb and assume this individual's name is Rob. So uh, thank you, Rob, for this resource. This is awesome. Uh, you don't have to download uh, multiple documents. You don't have to figure out which document has has which in, in a hurry. Uh, you know, whatever ruling you're looking for, you can just go to this website, um, which uh, I think, you know, unlimited Wi-Fi is going to load faster uh, than trying to download these documents. Uh, and uh, just type in your question uh, with a little bit of keyword action there. You can just get straight to uh, what you're looking for. Yeah, uh, pretty awesome. I We're going to try and include this in our Underworld's resources uh, page. This This is like a uh, I think people want to reach for a bunch. So, absolutely. And if you're listening, I it would be awesome if you add the errata uh, elements uh, to the site as well. Really continue that theme of all in one uh, location. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what you've already done is great. Uh, so uh, shout out to that. All right. I think we're going to jump into the main topic. You guys ready for that? Sound good? Sounds, Sounds good, good with me. All right. Uh, Skyler, you've kind of been our point man on this. So this is the point in the, in the podcast where I kind of turn the reins over to you and let you run wild here. So, uh, take us on a journey through these many, many changes in these documents. All right. Run wild. We shall. And what to start us with, then a change to changes, <laughs> <laughs> a change to changing. Um, we're going to kick off with, uh, the new update to Aflim Pandemonium's plot card here. Um, and right as I'm diving in, I think how we're going to structure this is we're going to do uh, what we've kind of titled as nerfs first, buffs second, and we'll kind of end cap our errata section uh, going over what we've kind of um, uh, broadly titled fixes. Um, and this this falls in that nerf camp yeah. uh, <laughs> and well-deserved. I'm, I'm sure many would uh, think so uh, plot card here, uh, change points two and four on the change sequence to read uh, two is now pick an opponent. That opponent chooses a surviving changer from your war band that has not been chosen this round stagger the chosen changer and four pick an opponent. That opponent chooses a surviving changer from your warband that has not been chosen this round. That opponent pushes the chosen changer one hex. So for those not overly familiar with their plot card, uh, it was four items that were all processed originally by the Pandemonium player. And the first one is choosing a changer that you get to inspire. The second one uh, was choosing when you had to stagger. Now the opponent's doing that. Third one choosing a changer that hasn't been chosen yet uh, to receive a uh, guard mm, token. Guard token, thank you. <laughs> and for, I, I could picture the guard token. I couldn't uh, <laughs> couldn't come up with the language. The shield uh, arrow thingy. Thingy yeah. majiggy. <laughs> uh, and four, finally, is uh, the push, uh, which is now uh, processed by your opponent. What do you two think about this change? I'm going to leave it to Brian, who is, is the person who's played by far the most pandemonium of any of us. Yeah. So one of the things is ephilim has been kind of stomping around Nemesis a lot. Um, and I think prior to Force of Frost, that was very clear. Force of Frost came out and uh, Dalmatang also cropped up. But Ephilim's was pretty dominant. Uh, I, I think I've been kind of juggling around ideas because I did agree as a pandemonium player, it was a bit auto win like uh, not not entirely but it was really uh forgiving it was hard to mess up their game plan um you start each round with this plot change sequence and it's mostly benefit the only negative is the stagger so it's like that's i mean a guard is a whole action a push it can usually be a move action essentially onto an objective and you're getting a inspire out of it. Like that's so that's crazy action economy uh, mm. for the pandemonium. And I think turning some of these into negatives and I love the alternating between you and your opponent, the you still get your choice of who inspires, but then they get to stagger somebody. So they get to choose their target essentially. 
Um, are they always going to pick the one in the front or do you think now that, Oh dang, they pick somebody in the back. They're going to dive bomb them. Like I love the, what the, <laughs> the opportunities for not eat. Uh, yeah. So I, I love that. Uh, it kind of helps. I think the theme and as well on FLMs, because it feels like uh, that chaotic nature of Zinch that it doesn't mm. always go according to plan or, uh, you know, Zinch throws a wrench, even in their own servants, uh, plans sure um by some grand design so i i love that the opponent is acting somewhat as an agent of chaos in this as from a mechanic standpoint um, yeah personally i don't think that this is this nerf is crippling to them i think it does take them like from s tier to a tier or something like that um sure. but i think this is something that the f1 player has plenty of tools to work around with um, yeah i think this does curb especially with the push in early rounds, this prevents an easy in force of uh, fearsome fortress. It prevents an easy earthworks or bold sortie uh, with seismic shock. It requires that they have to make three moves in order to get onto a feature token because uh, it'd be most, most of the time seismic shock is trying to hold three. And so getting that free push onto an objective uh, is just, cash money for them and as the game goes on and they lose changers they're gonna lose that push so that becomes really a factor in round one and if you're in round two or three and you still got that push that's going to the opponent you got all your all your changers alive that's not too bad yeah i really like that note actually uh the push being the opponent uh when it comes to the later rounds that means the pandemonium player is doing very well for themselves right uh so i don't think it's overly punishing for that to continue to be present as something your opponent's going to be able to process uh especially with their resurrection card right now there's some consideration on do i spend this resurrection card at the end of the round or do i hold on to it so that nobody gets pushed and then at the beginning of the next round i'm kind of down one card because i had to hold this over uh, but I still get my resurrection, which is a really big ability. Yeah, I I, I think uh, they did a really good job of targeting, and they in this, I guess, is MetaWatch, but uh, of, of finding ways. You know, there were a lot of there are a lot of things you could have paid attention to on the Pandemonium because you know they have right. really great stat lines when they're inspired. They're tankier than you think. They've got really great end phases. They've got amazing gambit spells. Uh, all those things, you know, and they're potentially fragile, right? Like they're in, in that um, they sometimes hinge around a couple key pieces. Uh, I don't. Maybe that's not even accurate. I, I, I feel like I can get them down to a couple changers and still be in trouble, uh, but. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that there were a lot of different ways to attack this. And this was, this was the, the way to attack it that uh, kind of taps the brakes on how fast they can make progress towards, uh, towards their objectives in hand, you know, cause uh, Brian, you mentioned seismic shock, but they've got closing the circle, right? So yeah, uh, if you slow down by one activation or power card, their ability to set up to, you know, to threaten that, um, if you make it so that bold sortie isn't automatically set up, that's, you know, the, the fearsome fortress card, uh, with the, the push or the, uh, Skylar, you'll know this better than me with the guard token in the fearsome fortress. Um, one that, that earthworks. earthworks. Yeah. If, uh, or siege master. Yeah. Or earthworks gets, uh, gets a little, um, just ever so slightly tougher, uh, and there's, there's counterplay and I think we always like to see counterplay. So I, I think this is actually a pretty clever way to go about it is just slow down that glory generation, let them retain that power in deck, uh, but just make it so that they have to signal a little bit more, or there's more chance for counterplay towards some of those things. Yeah. And, uh, to bounce off that point is there are so many things as the F1 player, there's so many things that people had complaints about whether like, cause they just had so many things going for them. They just had like every fighter has a unique thing that kind of takes them from being essentially makes them not a dangle bro. Uh, and a dangle bro being essentially an expendable fighter that isn't really impressive. Each one of the changers has something going for them. And so there's so many things that, as the F1 player, I would get complaints, you know, uh, like every single aspect seems strong, which 
what do you nerf and what, but the plot card affects all of them. And I think making that into this fun chess game, there's counterplay with alternating which fighter. If you really don't want one of your changers to get staggered or to be pushed into that lethal, you got to make that, that factors into your choices using the first and the third steps. I really like the back and forth here. Uh, I, I think that is far more interesting than like, let's say they had just said, oh, your opponent uh, processes the whole thing, right? To now when you go to inspire, have the thoughts of like, okay, do I inspire um, like my favorites or, you know, the one that I'm going to need the most for the round or do I inspire somebody that I don't want to be staggered right. um, or potentially pushed, right? Like you kind of start thinking like two and four, the opponent's going to process, you know, so with that inspire, you might be guarding against that stagger with that guard token. You're, you might be guarding against uh, the push uh, and, or it might be, you know, plan is normal. Like, no, that's okay. I need this one inspired for my, my purposes. Uh, I'll let them stagger. And then from there um, I'll figure out which one I want to guard. Like, it's just all of the, all of the nuances here, I think really continues to add uh, like a sort of, play expression uh, yeah. to, to the game. And I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. I do. My final point I want to point out is like, this is really elegant too, because both of these steps offer quite a simple solution for the opponent. It's not like the opponent gets to choose which one inspires and then they're going, okay, but what is it? What are the stats on the other side? What are the stats on the other side? And kind of like adding more time to the game. Uh, it doesn't create too much analysis paralysis for the opponent. Um, it's either, do I want to hit that one or do I want to hit that one? Do I want to be able to reach that one or do I want to get him further away from mm, the combat mm, yeah. like that? I think the last thing I want to add uh, regarding this change too is when combined with the previous errata where Aphelum has a bubble of two now instead of three, that when there's two changers within that bubble, the wizard level goes Ooh, up on Aphelum. Yeah. And so with this push... Uh, there's that interesting element uh, right out of the gate where one of your considerations can be, do I push uh, one of these changers outside of Ephilim's bubble, especially if that's the one that's been then granted? Like, mm -hmm. I imagine that'll be something that the Ephilim player is really thinking about. Like, I need to, if I want to be able to cast here from... Um, you know, from the get-go with that extra wizard level, then I'm going to need to make sure that these fighters aren't available for the push later. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, does anybody have any other thoughts that they want to add to the Eflum Pandemonium errata? I do want to point out that there was a cool, like, uh, when this dropped, I think the intention was clear, but uh, the push step was worded in a way that the opponent chooses which fighter gets pushed but they didn't execute the push but i think the intention was that they execute the push but there was a hot fix or like a quick uh update to the document once the internet kind of realized uh so i, I want to appreciate the responsiveness uh from gw and metal yeah. to, to jump on that that's a level of agility that we haven't typically seen so it was, yeah. that was really cool to see good call out as we kind of go through this document it really feels like that MetaWatch team that's been installed, uh, I think it's safe to say, uh, has been busy. It's cool. It's cool to see, like, you know, we got that video uh, mentioned the formation of that team. And I don't think we've really felt the impact of a team like that being formed uh, until now. Like, I it, hope we get to see more videos. Me too. Yeah, I really love that one. I, I, I'm 100% I'm with you. That's a good good shout. So. Agree. Uh, what, what about the other boogeyman? Yeah. Uh, all right. Domaton Storm Coven. So I'll run this one down. Uh, this is a change to each of their fighters. Change the harness, the aether ability to read as follows. After another friendly fighter's activation, one uninspired friendly fighter with this ability must use it. Reaction. After another friendly fighter's activation, inspire this fighter, then uninspire each other friendly fighter. What does that all mean? That means that after an uninspired fighter goes, then another fighter is going to have to 
make this reaction and pass the inspiration over. Does it have to be another uninspired fighter or can it be any other fighter? So just to, just to lay the groundwork, like Domitans had three fighters that could pass around the leadership through their inspire. Basically anytime a fighter made an action uh, or took an activation, they could inspire one and uninspire the others. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have to happen. Like the, the fighter that activates does not have to be uninspired. It could Oops, like basically. Yep. yep. Essentially it, it was all that Domitan players control who was inspired and if they wanted to pass it or not. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So now it's any time I see. So the, the language here, uh, another friendly fighters activation uh, and one uninspired friendly fighter. So when we're at the beginning of the game and you have three fighters, as soon as one of them activates, then one of the uninspired fighters has to take it on. So if you activate it with an inspired fighter or an uninspired fighter, it's moving, right? Yeah. But then once you're down to two fighters, um, if your uninspired fighter is the one that activates, then it's not getting passed because it's looking for another friendly fighter's activation. It feels very surgical. Very uh, surgical, yeah. Essentially, if you're down to two models and you want to leave somebody inspired, then the only way to do that while activating models is to continually activate the one that's not inspired. Right. Yeah. I, that, okay, that so they accurate. can't keep using their inspired Voltron. Correct. As soon as they activate their inspired one, it'll pass to the uninspired one. Okay. All right. Woo! I had <laughs> I've read this. I've I've understood it. <laughs> and I had to like rewrap my head around it live right here. <laughs> yeah. I so it it I have not I've maybe played one game as Domitan. I played a ton against them. Uh I've I feel like I've heard less from the community about this change than I have uh, from Ephilim. I, this is undoubtedly like a, a nerf, like the ability to decide who had the defensive boost and who is going to, you know, like I'll, I'll have somebody inspired and use their inspired uh, spell attack profile or, or some such and just use them again and again until they're gone. Um, I think this is a pretty, pretty substantial hit. Uh, they've retained the nice, uh, insurance policy of once they're down to one, that person will be inspired. Um, cause that's the other caveat of their inspire condition or actually their, their actual inspire condition reads each other friendly fighter is out of action. And it's just the reaction that lets them, uh, circumvent that. Uh, yeah. Cause but, if I'm ahead. understanding this correctly, like you're essentially the, the nerf here is the player agency, the player's choice, um, mm -hmm. or they have to be more intentional about their choice. Uh, cause they used to, when you had three or two fighters remaining, obviously when you only have one, they're inspired all the time, Yeah. but you, you could pass it around as willy nilly when you had three or choose not to. Now yep. it must, when you have three, Yeah. when you have two, you, if you don't want it to keep passing, you must keep using the uninspired fighter. Right. I know a play pattern that I saw a lot was to, you know, charge somebody forward into enemy lines uh, or, you know, uh, as close as comfortable and then get that fighter inspired and leave them inspired, right? So if you were going to deal with the one up front, they were going to have all of their inspired bonuses. They were going to be that forward point that could um, spell cast off the level two wizard. They would have, you know, two shields that you'd have to get through. Uh, so they were, they were quite difficult to get through and get past because the front runner got to keep all the benefits of being the inspired one at all times. Uh, meanwhile, you could activate the ones in the back um, and not worry about it. But I guess really the play pattern I kept seeing was that that one in the front just kept getting activated um, after maybe a move uh, into that or, position. Or in later rounds, right? Like uh, yeah. charged in at the end of round one and then is in the middle of enemy lines for round two and just starts licking shots in the atmosphere from uh, right there in the middle of everything and retaining that two block. Yep, absolutely. So this is going to be, I, I'm, I'm really interested to see how this one um, like pans out, especially yeah. 
I, I think it elevates um, the skill uh, floor for the warband. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's harder to play this warband to success um, than it was before because you have to be really mindful of who you're activating when to make sure that you're taking advantage uh, with that um, harness the aether moving around the room. Yeah, it feels much more difficult to map out your turn. And it was already, in my mind, not having played that much, it was already a little bit challenging to, like, you know, uh, correctly plan out a turn uh, to have everything where you want it. But here, I think you really get caught out where, like, ooh, I was planning on casting that Gambit spell, but Leona's up front, and now she's no longer inspired, so now she's a level one. So am I casting that from back here on Sarpon, who's my inspired, but in the back line, I can't reach who I want, you know. So, uh, I I think I I really like the mention of the skill floor sort of thing. I think the I think that's a, a good way of thinking about it, and I, I agree. Um, I I think it's going to be interesting to see how they perform moving forward. One thing uh, that we should touch on, too, is the reaction window. Because now that it's mandatory, that is um, something we really haven't seen before. Uh, I Ooh, think that's I a think, really good point. I think this is the first ever mandatory reaction window. And that means this is always going to occupy that window for Domiton Storm Coven player. Oh, that's um, really big, actually. I didn't, huh. I didn't think about that. So, yeah. um, out of curiosity, after I was an activation. That's a that's a frequent reaction window. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And um, that was the first thing Phil Phil camping on the episode today. Um, but Phil is our resident uh, Domiton Storm Coven player, and when he first saw this, um, when we were uh, discussing it that was the first thing he did was he dove back into their cards and was like, does that affect any of their in-house windows like that they're already bringing? Like, have they just been kicked out of any of like the reactions that are offered by their upgrades? Uh, and I guess the answer was no, mm. which I find really interesting. Cool. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good I, for them. I, I, I it's interesting. Cause like, in championship play, this is a warband that, and I will say that I have not built a championship deck with these. However, if I look at a warband and say, ooh, there's a lot of range three and very powerful range two attacks available to this warband, then I say, duelist speed seems real juicy for this uh, warband, but duelist speed will only be usable if they, uh, if they get themselves to a state where they're down to one fighter. Uh, and then it's great, you know, but uh, yeah, ooh, interesting. All right, yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing if somebody continues to um, to champion these guys. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious how this. Obviously, I think this will uh, mix up their. I I don't know how Domitans work intimately enough to know how big of an effect this is uh, to Domitans. Um but I know that they were particularly feel bads in champs uh, where they could really flex all the pings that they could bring and use that forward fighter to just cast, cast, cast and get a bunch of pings off. So I'm yeah. um, curious if this has a larger effect in nemesis or oh, championship. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like how heavy is the impact? Is it, sure. is it the same in both yeah. metas? That's a good, good, uh, good thought there. When thinking about what, we'll see received nerfs in the future um, or like what kind of brought these nerfs into play this time around. I think the fact that Domiton Storm Coven was uh, oppressive in both Nemesis and Championship uh, has, has a lot to do with it. Like I think uh, it, it was something I was thinking about earlier where if, you know, one warband is dominating in Nemesis or Championship, but but just one of them, um, that's pro that could be evaluated as enough, you know, to bring them forward for a nerf. I think especially uh, if it's Nemesis that they're dominating in, because uh, championship, there's always tools uh, to kind of try to help overcome those challenges. Sure. Um, uh, but if, and, and that's not always true, right? Uh, but if a warband 
um, or, you know, a gambit, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, is dominating in multiple formats, uh, then I, th- I think we'll always see a nerf uh, follow, right? Um, yeah. Ephilims was definitely more uh, prevalent in Nemesis than in Championship, but wasn't without um, like a presence in Championship towards towards the higher end. Sure. Um, but Domita and Storm Coven, I remember like before we saw them kind of invade Nemesis, they were um, at the very top of Championship, and so for them to then um, you know receive more Nemesis attention uh, and like Amon has uh, won worlds with them recently. Uh, so that's definitely, um, you know, at the forefront here too. Before this update, you know, we're seeing this update uh, a month or two uh, after worlds, maybe maybe two at most. Um, I don't, uh, but anyways, uh, that's all to say that uh, it's really interesting seeing like what's, receiving nerfs and i think anytime you see somebody uh in both formats uh as a problem then you're you're gonna see them on the nerf list pretty quickly yeah i think the last thing i want to say about the warband is that uh, i think one of their inherent strengths is just how much redundancy they carry uh they will absolutely they will always have an inspired fighter after that first activation they will always have a leader they will always have a level two caster unless there's shenanigans that uninspire. Uh, and those are relatively rare and particularly rare in Nemesis. Um, but uh, I, I think in this game, guaranteeing yourself redundancy is is a pretty spectacular strength. So uh, although I think this is a really strong nerf, uh, I think they have some inherent strengths that, that may allow them to uh, persevere through it. I think so too. Uh, same same with pandemonium. Mm. Yeah. So so far, they neither warband seem to be they taken down a notch, not nerfed into oblivion. Right. Agree. Yeah, on on uh, first glance, that's where I'm feeling as well. All right, we have uh, one more nerf to talk about, and that is from the Force of Frost deck. Um, any anybody want to take a guess as to what card? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's got to be Chasm Key. <laughs> ah, there it is. All right, so Chasm Keaton, <laughs> Abyssos Avalanche, uh, change this card to read as follows. Uh, Gambit spell, focus. If cast, remove one ice counter from this fighter, then deal one damage to each fighter in the same territory as the caster, and then place up to one available feature token in an empty hex in that territory. Uh, so the change here being, if cast, remove one ice counter from this fighter. Yeah. Can I just say, was that feature token thing always in there? Because <laughs> uh, I've been so obsessed with the other parts of that card that uh, I, I don't know that I could have told you that that was part of it, but sure enough. I actually had forgotten that as well. <laughs> Everybody always talks about uh, the damage, and rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> I forget that, you know, thematically, there's also an ice column, like, yeah. landing onto the, onto the board. <laughs> yeah, which situationally can be amazing, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think everybody knew that something was happening to this card. Uh, and, I had to. Yeah, and, and I don't, this is kind of a, a, I don't know, this is a, a side tangent, but uh, I think the existence of Nemesis is a format uh, made the design team slash meta watch decide to make this an errata instead of just a forsaken for me. Like I, I think in the past, a, a card like this might've gotten forsaken. Uh, they're like, Hey, this is just too powerful. Let's just kick it out. But it's harder, harder to do that in nemesis because if you are including force of frost, you, uh, only have 64 cards to pick from your 32 from your infaction and your 32 from force of frost. And so, uh, chopping a whole card out of that 64 is a bigger deal than chopping out of like a pool of, you know, whatever 500 cards or something like that. Yeah. And that might feel warranted for something like Abyssos avalanche, but it really feels bad for somebody who's going to their first tournament and might not have brought the extra cards and the TO having to tell them you have an illegal card here. Um, like that's, 
that that would be big fields bad. So I think they do have to essentially errata things now instead of forsaking. So I don't know if we'll see forsaking outside of strictly championship type cards. Yeah. And so I, th- I think that increases the pressure to find a errata that makes this card into something that is, uh, something that is less oppressive. You know, I'm sure there was discussions like, do we increase the casting cost? Do we, you know, change yeah. what it does? What I think this is pretty cool because it makes the, it, it retains the casting cost, it retains the effect of the card, but this slows it down. Right? Yeah, there was tons of chatter about like how to go about fixing this. And uh, aside from just the forsake it. Um, but I, I also saw the make it like two channels uh, for the casting costs. And I was like that to me, that felt like it would just be the rich get richer. And like nobody else who has like, if you only have a level one wizard, you just don't have access to this card. Like it's just not feasible without card support and really heavy card support um, yeah. to get your wizard level up to two. And then somebody like Domitans would still just be romp running around with this, but the ultimate feel bads and what everybody hated about this card is round one charge in and with a level two wizard and drop this on your opponent before they had any opportunity to move fighters out of their territory Uh, and i think this really slows that down because you need that ice counter so it requires card combos so you got to invest further in the deck and you got to hope that those cards come up in your hand yeah yeah and that round one With this change, that round one play is still possible, but it's so much harder. Like you need, I think there's two gambits. Um, I could be wrong. There could be three, but two come to mind. Uh, Time freeze. And then there's the one where you drop a uh, ice uh, feature token um, or the the block text. uh, Drop that into play in your territory or no one's territory and give an ice counter to somebody on your team adjacent to it. Um, not remembering the name of that one, but um, both of those uh, award a nice counter at gambit speed. But um, there's some interesting implications there as well, like time freeze. If you're going to give an ice counter um, to that fighter, then they're going to be like out of position. Uh, sure, they just got a guard co- token too, and maybe they've done their job well enough. They've got an abyssess. Uh, avalanche off round one um but i really like the implication there that like there there's there's a cost like even at gambit mm-hmm. speed um and with the other one you know you have to drop that feature token in no one's territory or your territory and then be adjacent to it so it limits you know positioning wise where you can be and even then we're talking about one card out of 20 i mean that's probably the best card you know, suited to combo with this, but we're going to see uh, just in the fact that you'd have to draw those together in round one, mm-hmm. we're going to see so many fewer round one Avasoth Avalanche plays. Yeah. Uh, and if you are taking Force of Frost, then you are, uh, you know, like you maybe you are trying to work towards that that frost counter payoff at the end, you know? So I, I really like this. I, I think the, I think the most impressive thing about this was how fast it could come out and how, how low the cost was for, you know, I'll take one damage on one of mine for one on all of yours. Uh, and here it's not gone, you know, but it's less likely to come off early and the lines are more likely to be tangled and there's less, uh, less of a, you know, uh, best case use scenario that will present itself. Yeah. Now it's going to feel like a feat to pull this off in the best case use scenario. Yeah. Agree. And something I've heard you talk about before, Davey, is, um, and you kind of touched on it there, is that, you know, in, by the time you can get this online now, um, then you're going to be more mixed up, right? So the chances of it only affecting one of your fighters are much lower than it was before because uh, it gives both players a chance and time enough, you know, for them to get entangled. And it's like, now, now is it worth it? Um, Yeah. Which, which I really like. Yep. Um, one, one other thing I'll mention uh, is you you got my mind racing when you were talking about you know how they've moved to Arata versus uh, Forsaken you know or or some sort of similar uh, equivalent here, and I bet that has to do with rivals because um, mm, this sure. is a, this is a complete thirty two card deck 
And if I wanted to plug that into a fighter and play rivals, uh, if this card was just disallowed, then I would no longer have access to it. And so I, I, I think if I had to like bet money, they just want us to be able to continue. They, they, they really are probably looking at that 32 card deck um, as kind of like a, like a sacred thing that they don't want to break up. It's like, no, you purchase 32 cards, you're going to get to play with them, whether that's rivals where you have, like, th this is all you have available to you. We don't want to, uh, you know, have this deck forsaken entirely from the rivals yeah. format. Yeah. Um, or you're playing nemesis and you really only have those 64 cards. Um, they probably still want to make sure that, that you're able to play with it. I, I think that is the correct logical endpoint that I was not able to bring myself to uh, because I probably have a little bit of a blind spot to rivals. So I think that's a really good call. All right. Well, that wraps up our nurse. Uh, and let's let's try, dive straight into buffs from there. Mm. Uh, all right. So is there uh, one of the three buffs that either of you would like us to tackle first? Let's actually talk. Um, this is a tip of the hat to Underworlds Underground. Grisels, Aaron, and I had a uh, had a change, and this I actually had to read it a second time because it's like, what is the change here? Um, and this is uh, that each fighter, the acrobatic ability becomes as follows: when this fighter is dealt damage by an attack action, reduce that damage by one to a minimum of zero for each dodge in the defense roll. Uh, we very rarely see the ability to reduce damage to zero. Um, I don't want to say this is the first time because I may be overlooking something, but it is rare enough that this might be, you know, the first. Skyler's uh, head crack is thick hide comes to mind. Oh, like sure. That. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I mean, even then it's not, <laughs> what is it? It's uh, if you were to be dealt uh, precisely one, one damage, damage yeah. uh, you, you are not dealt that damage instead. Yeah. Uh, reduced uh, crit, to zero. Crit on... Uh, war paint or what's the lucky right you know, lucky war paint. Board. yeah well and that just stops the uh uh comment yeah. sequence but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, anyway <laughs> we've definitely seen like abilities to forego damage they're rare very rare yeah, yeah. and to reduce to zero uh, i would say even rarer like the just like the the ability to potentially reduce more than one um or you know down to that zero uh, or very often you see an ability like this with that minimum of one, as we saw before. Yeah. So like for been playing a lot of discord, uh, Vexmore's ability to reduce damage by one, if I get no successes feels really great, but he's also a tank. He's five wounds, large fighter, uh, for the arena. It's so infrequent that you actually get to reduce the damage and they only have like two or three health each. So it's really impactful to actually be able to reduce the damage down to zero because uh, they don't get many opportunities to reduce the damage at all. Totally. Um, and it's not something that comes up a ton, right? Because, uh, you know, like with your example of Vexmore, uh, if there's no modifiers, nothing else in play, then he's and he's uninspired, then it's happening half the time. Pretty frequent, right? Right. You know? um, uh, once Cleave enters the conversation and, and other things like that, then, you know, maybe even more often or it gets more complicated. But these uh, these fighters are looking for dodges, you know, so it's each dice face has uh, only a one in six chance of triggering this. Um, but uh, I, I think it's cool. And uh, I... It makes me really want to try them out. It's just like a, here's a just a little tweak. Um, I really like this a lot. I'm I'm excited to to see this one in play because I think it's a really interesting, cool warband. Agreed. I want to compare them to Wormspat real quick. I just I double checked. Uh, Wormspat is a minimum of one, uh, and I really like the difference here uh, thematically because if you're playing the Wormspat, uh, first off, they have enough health to really take those hits. Whereas the arena are frequently on, uh, you know, two wounds as their base. Uh, and so that could be a ping and, uh, you know, one hit and they're, and they're out of it. Right. 
uh, or they manage to you know only take one damage and and then it's like can I dodge you know this hit no you absolutely can't not like you're even if you rolled two dodges right now uh, we're not going to let you reduce the damage because you know minimum one you're dead uh, and w- comparing it to worm spat like you've got these big bulky decaying fighters that are coming at you and so having the minimum of one there feels really like good feels interesting because they can take it and you're just kind of like uh like they're chipping away they're still happy to you know to only be taking one damage to their health bar uh instead of you know whatever was coming in um but like you're still landing those hits and you're just watching them like decay as they continue to come come into you whereas here with the arena now if somebody's able to reduce to zero it feels acrobatic. It feels like they were able to dodge, uh, you know, away from the hit unscathed. And I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, who's got another one they want to talk about? Yeah, uh, I'll jump in here with Scavix Plague Pack. Yeah, you're the right one to do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, this is a change to Scritter. Change the worthless ability to read as follows. This fighter cannot be dealt damage by gambits. If this fighter would be taken out of action, remove it from the battlefield and clear all counters and persisting effects from this fighter. It is not taken out of action. So the change here uh, is this fighter cannot be dealt damage by gambits. And as somebody who's put, (laughs) I think, uh, the most time into the plague pack locally, uh, (laughs) this is so welcome. I'm just so happy (laughs) to see this. Uh, The amount of times where... I would just lose Scritter, what would feel like inconsequentially, uh, was um, al- always deflating. <laughs> Where uh, so now, you know, somebody actually has to either have, a, you know, some sort of upgrade uh, to, that's going to deal damage to take them out. But most of the time, this is going to be uh, an attack uh, or an ability, uh, an upgrade, an ability. Um, and I think that's fun, like that in those rare cases, an upgrade or ability um, could sneak through and be the death of Scritter. Um, so that'll be kind of like matchup dependent. Sure. But most of the time, it's going to reti- require an attack uh, to get rid of Scritter. And I I think that's really great. Um, no notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think I'd seen this change, uh, floated as a possibility, you know, people are hypothesizing like, well, well what could we give, uh, to this war band? Um, and this is incredibly modest, right? Like this is, uh, only affects pings in a deck, you know, gambit, gambit damage. Um, and in most nemesis decks, you're talking maybe two or three cards there that if they want to spend it on your potentially least consequential fighter, then theoretically you're like, okay, well they burned it on him instead of someone else. But, uh, it's a war band that, uh, the health totals aren't huge. And so I think it was easier to spend a gambit on, on, uh, that fighter. Um, and making them use a whole attack feels, you know, it feels thematic. Like, Hey, like I got to waste my time, like stepping on this rat, like, oh man. Um, so, uh, Agreed. yeah, I, I think it's cool. Uh, I, yeah, uh, you, of course, for... uh, like you were talking about, like thinking about abilities or other ways around, I, uh, what jumped to mind was, uh, seized weapon, which is the, uh, <laughs> grim watch, you know, uh, put this upgrade on somebody and then deal one damage to somebody adjacent. So this can still do it. And I, I like picturing that just being like, you know, whatever ghoul is just picking up scritter and using scritter to pummel other people. <laughs> 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 rough my wife is appalled as a <laughs> fan of skaven uh but one of the things i like as a comparison is like uh spine fin from elethane soul raid but they can bring the spine fin back um mm-hmm. all the time and both spine fin and scritter are utility pieces for the warbands but scritter uh scritter doesn't come back uh, so this feels really good to kind of give them that little bit of extra protection and yeah, having to make them spend a whole activation actually attacking it. Um, Agreed. And I, I want to jump in on that utility piece because for me, uh, you know, when piloting Scritter, uh, if somebody was like, where do I put this, you know, gambit damage? Um, do I use it to chip away another fighter? And as Davey mentioned, you know, often that's probably going to be unneeded um, to um, like get through a health bar and another fighter. Um, so 
that kind of will push the equation towards Skritter um, even more uh, because of the health, uh, to Davy's point. But Skritter is is like a vital piece of this warband because this warband really cares about positioning um, with any amount of their fighters. Um, you know, they need two in a territory if they're not on objectives to. Um, uh, I was going to say desecrate, but to corrupt uh, that territory. Uh, and they need befowlers, you know, hanging out on objective tokens uh, to do it, you know, solo. And Skritter, Skritter is one of the befowler pieces or one of the pieces that, you know, can add up to that two in a territory. So very often I found, you know, when a gambit was used on Skritter, like that gambit would just impact my game plan so strongly. Um, because you have six fighters and to just instantly be reduced to five fighters when you're playing towards spreading out and positioning, um, just, uh, made it that much harder to play them and succeed. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's cool. And I think it's a nice subtle tweak that, um, is helpful. Uh, that just leaves sons of Elmore. All right, Brian, do you want to read this one? Yeah, I'll go ahead and read this because I don't fully comprehend it. Uh, (laughs) Uh, so King Morlach Velmorn, uh, changed the deadly command reaction to read as follows reaction. Use this in the first reaction step of each action phase and, or after each of this fighter's activations, give this fighter one command counter. While this fighter has one or more command counters, it is supporting each friendly grave guard. Clear these counters at the end of the action phase. Uh, what I don't understand here is they he got a buff recently, right? What does this change? Yeah, I can jump in there. So the previous buff, and you're right, um, and uh, seeing the incremental buffs, by the way, uh, I just want to take a note to say that I really appreciate that that they initially released you know, one buff, tested it, wanted to see how it looks. And I think this is a testament to that. They're keeping an eye on this stuff. Um, They're, they're listening to the feedback that players send in because they decided, you know what? Uh, It, you know, wasn't, it didn't push the needle enough for us. Uh, We're going to, we're going to tweak it. Yeah. This is the mirror image of Ephilim. Like one nerf didn't move it enough. Here's another one. Exactly. Um, And so Brian, uh, what we're looking at here is the previous iteration changed it so that the reaction was strictly uh, at the beginning of the round or beginning of each action phase. So it was offloading the need for Velmorn to have to activate first each round to to get access to that uh, command counter. It was just a reaction that you'd, you'd get right at the beginning of each, each action phase. And so you'd have it out the gate. Um, but that limited your re, like amount of command counters you could have um, to one per action phase. Now, there are gambits yeah. that will add to that. Um, but th- it used to be that when Velmorn would activate, you know, he could activate multiple times in a round and he could get you multiple command counters. Um, so this last tweak removed his ability to generate more of them. Um, and just get, make sure that, you know what, you don't have to move him. We're going to make sure that you just have him. His, his command is inherent. Um, mm. Whereas now, not only is his command inherent, you're going to get that at the beginning, but now every time he activates as well, you can process this reaction um, and he's barking, you know, more commands uh, and getting more command counters. So it just yeah. stacks now. Yep. Uh, they clear at the end of the phase too. I remember... Um, Back when people were first discussing Sons of Elmorn, um, like buffs, uh, one of the ideas was simply to delete, clear these counters at the end of the action phase. Um, that was really popular. I remember there was even like a, a vassal tournament that was looking to test out kind of some community ideas. Um, and so with that one, it would be like kind of. The first time Velmorn activates, he would have gotten uh, his command counter and then he could hold on to it as long as he wanted and kind of add to it over the course of the game. Um, and I, I think I really like I, I really like where they landed. Um, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. I will be because uh, I'm um, hot on Velmorn with uh, the masks, uh, mobile masks. So I'll be trying that out here soon uh, for fun. Um, but uh now 
Like you're guaranteed at least one each round, even if you spent it from the previous round. And then as you activate him, you get access to more. So mm -hmm. um, I, I can kind of see where the last change felt more like a change um, where, yes, you're now able to activate or you, you, you have that command counter without having to activate Valmorn. So you're not restricted. You're not taxed your first action of every round. So that's a buff. It definitely was. Um, but I can see how players might have felt like it wasn't, um, it wasn't enough for him. Uh, and that, you know, he's kind of been removed from being able to give himself more command counters. I had more yeah, to say, I, more to say on this one than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely heard some people think the last one was more of a side grade than an upgrade. Um, my, my son really welcomed it cause he really hated the action tax at the beginning of the round, like being like, uh, oh, like I, I got to decide whether I'm going to, uh, you know, attack at lower efficiency or do a, a nothing action with Velmorn that stinks. Um, so yeah, this is, this is letting them have the best of both worlds. And, uh, I think, you know, it's not like they're taking the world by storm. So I, I think it's cool. I'm glad to see it. I agree. What, right. uh, what do we got after the, uh, nerfs and buffs? Yeah. So, uh, we're entering, uh, what I labeled as fixes and the last category is nerfs and buffs. Um, it was easy to, to look at those and think first, like these are meant holistically as nerfs and buffs. So although, um, some of these fixes, um, could easily get categorized as a nerf or a buff, I feel like fundamentally they're here as fixes. Uh, and then like whether or not they add a little power or take a little power away, um, is kind of, um, not the main focus of the change. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of going into these, why I'm calling these fixes. When, when you say fixes, you're, you're saying like, so they work how you might intuitively think they work. Is that, would that be an accurate way of describing this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, like if there was something that made these clunky or, or or not work possibly as intended um i feel like these are kind of um uh, fix that address that made sure that uh it's clear to players um what uh, the intent was and what they're capable of doing uh so on that note uh exile dead great example here uh i could see uh, this being talked about as a buff because as, like there's definitely more power added in here if you were restricting them based on previous language. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that was the intent. Um, so with that, we have two changes. We have Deantelos the Exile um, getting a change to Dance and Apprentice Markov getting a change to Puppeteer. And so those read, uh, the Dance here is uh, Action, Pick, Move, or Attack, each friendly conductive fighter can make one action or super action. If it is a scything attack action of that kind, then, uh, and this is, this is as it was, uh, place up to one friendly out of action conductive minion in an adjacent hex, two or more hexes from each enemy fighter and give that minion one raise counter. Um, so before I dive into that, I'm also going to just uh, bring up Markov's here. The changes to Puppeteer. Uh, and it reads, action, this fighter and a friendly Regulus can make, or sorry, can each make one action or super action other than this action. And then the, the rest remains the same. You can then place up to one friendly out of action Regulus in an empty hex within two hexes and give that Regulus one raise counter. So I think the exiled dead um, were unintentionally hit um, as we've defined out what a super action is because yeah. these changes here were how they were originally. And uh, I'm not sure if there was, you know, uh, who, who knows, uh, you know, if there was an internal decision when super action language was changed, uh, let's, let's see if this shakes out for exile dead um, or, or not. Um, I think, you know, historically we've seen um, changes uh, similar that have uh, had ripples that were unintended and then kind of patched up later. 
And if I had to guess, I think this is one of those that um, this was a ripple and they wanted to very clearly say, um, hey, the conductive minions with scything, they're supposed to be able to scythe. Um, And Regulus, uh, he's supposed to be able to charge, you know, when he's um, the subject of the puppeteer action there. That tracks. Which... Uh, I really like uh, seeing this. Uh, I think uh, so. I actually played Exiled Dead at a tournament uh, at a Madtown Throwdown uh, while this wasn't in place, and um, it restricted my ability to charge with Regulus. We actually didn't uh, we didn't find at the tournament any issue with um, those conductive minions um, scything. Uh, so mm-hmm. I didn't have like a limitation like that, but I, I am glad to see it here, you know, see it cleaned up here, stated very cleanly, clearly uh, that mm-hmm. they're able to do so. Sure. Um, but I always thought that that was like, um, so like Prentice Markov and Regulus as, you know, one half of the war band and Deantelos and, you know, um, his conductive horde is the other half of the war band. And what made Prentice Markov feel special, unique, um, was that, you know, Regulus could charge over and over and over again. Um, and so not having that in there, it made that half of the warband feel less like something you'd visit, less like something you would lean into. And, uh, it felt like a unique piece of them was missing, you know, Mm. while, while this has been away. So I'm really happy to see this re-added. Makes sense. Any other, uh, thoughts, feelings on the exile dead here? No, I think a lot of these fixes will just be kind of helping us understand what the fix was. You know, you it's most most impactful to the people who play that warband and had frustrations because they're trying to play it rules as written, but had some had some sense somewhere that it was not really how it was supposed to go. Agree. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna run these down, um, but I'm gonna be passing the mic around. So. Uh, next one I'm going to jump into for us is Cogger's Ravagers. Uh, shout out, Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gotta. <laughs> so uh, putting this under the fix camp uh, once again, uh, and this is each fighter change the inspire condition on each fighter card to read. There are two or more desecration tokens on the battlefield. And then uh, additionally, uh, a change to Dower Kragen and Razak Godblessed. Uh, change the despoil ability to read uh, despoil immediately after the final power step of the round, uh, desecrate an objective this fighter is holding. And so um, for those who are unfamiliar with Kagger's Ravagers, what these used to look like uh, is the inspire condition on each fighter card used to read. uh, I'm just going to pull it up real quick uh, to make sure I read this uh, verbatim. Uh, After an activation, there are two or more desecration tokens on the battlefield. Uh, so not only did you have to have two desecration tokens down, but you also had to wait for that after an activation window. Um, and to spoil used to be if this fighter holds an objective at the end of the action phase, uh, that's when you would desecrate that objective. So it would be the very last thing uh, after an act um, at, at the end of the action phase. So, um, would either of you like to touch more on this change? I recently played a game against Alex and he knew full well how awkward this was. And he explained it exactly how it had to go. And I was just like, man, that feels bad. Yeah. Uh, basically he met the condition. He had to go through the whole end phase cycle before being able to draw a new card and then drawing it in the beginning of the round. And it just felt really awkward. This will be much tidier. Um, uh, match along with all the other scoring sequences. So happy for them. Yeah, agree. Uh, the old conditions were written in a time prior to all of our spelled out windows. Um, and so this change to me feels like it, it absolutely just aligns um, with the way uh, our defined windows uh, exist today. Um, so no more awkward waiting for um an activation once you've earned your your desecrations, especially with how easy it is to remove desecration tokens. Um, they're removed in a power step if anybody's sitting on them um, or if the um, tokens ever flipped, um, they're removed. And so uh, you don't have to 
wait that out anymore. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I, one, one egregious thing that I know uh, I've seen as well is they had a surge uh, that scores immediately after uh, a token is desecrated. And that used to, or so like as soon as they added in the windows, like, hey, here's where you process a surge. Um, if they used to spoil on Dower Kragen and Razix at the end of the action phase um, to desecrate an objective, they would then put the surge down on the table, uh, poor, poor Alex would, and say, um, hey, I don't have a surge window when I can score this. So this is going to sit here, score <laughs> like ready to score, and I won't get to see a new card going into end phase. I'm going to have two cards during the end phase, and I'll draw two, uh, and then at the beginning of the next round, this will actually score, and I'll get my third card. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. um, yeah. Uh, glad to see this line lined up better <laughs> with the the way the game's played today. So, I think we can kind of cruise through these next ones. The Thorns of the Briar Queen uh, has seen an update to Varklav. Uh, change Varklav's action on both sides of the fighter card to read action. Choose one or more friendly chain rass. Push the chosen chain rass up to two hexes towards the nearest enemy fighter. This fighter can only make this action once per round. Yeah, as a center of attention enjoyer, this feels similar in terms of cleaning it up. That if, for instance, you had a chain rass that was adjacent to an enemy fighter, they couldn't be pushed closer. Uh, can you still push them? Uh, mm-hmm. Or can you still use this ability on everybody else but that one guy? Basically, yeah, you don't have to activate that one or push that one. Uh, uh, so it, that, is, that's is, my guess is it feels the, like a center of attention, uh, keeping in line with center of attention type. The change here was choose one or more instead of like all, instead of just saying push every chain rasp, yep, which well, was, would like maybe break it. Yeah, yep, okay. push all friendly chain rasps. Okay. So like then you'd have one spoiler, one chain rasp adjacent, and then you couldn't do the whole ability and push everybody else. But this says up to or choose one or more so you don't choose that one because they can't get closer sure interestingly uh this could this could fall under the buff camp too uh because by moving it from all um to choose up to or yeah you know choose one or more friendly fighters or friendly chain rafts there um you can now be well i guess i guess that was the way it worked before i was gonna say you can be surgical like if you have um, you know, chain rafts that you don't want pushed. Um, you know, previously this ability said, you know, push them all up to two hexes. So you, if a push is going to be processed, it has to push them one, um, at minimum, right? So all of a sudden all your chain rafts have to move. And this is making sure that no, you can actually pick which ones are going to move. So if you've got one on an objective or something like that, um, yeah, it's good. But I think a lot of the confusion uh, here from before was the fact that um, uh, there was a FAQ that had a pushes of zero, um, which was allowed previously. And we'll kind of get, get to that. Like it was a contradiction to the rules as written was that you could choose zero for a push. So I think this is going to go hand in hand with that. Makes sense. Uh, next up. Uh, is fighters that um, affect the game from out of action with counter abilities. So there are three of these here, um, and you can look these up. Um, we want to want to. Uh, we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty now of the changes when it comes to the errata, uh, and we kind of want to save some time in this episode uh, for the FAQ and um, champ changes. Um, give that a little bit of time. So. Uh, what is going on here is Flame Spooler, Sharpener of the Blade, and Creep Kin Whisper uh, have all seen updates to their abilities. They each grant a counter, um, and it used to be up to debate, you know, if that counter would continue to bestow an effect upon the game once that fighter was out of action. They've now gone in and changed each of these. Um, so they've changed Warp Splash, Wet the Blade, and Barbs 
to grant the counter and they've added an additional ability uh, to each of these fighters that makes sure that that counter that's been given uh, continues to have effect on the game even when the fighter is out of action. Yeah, I think pretty simple. Uh, I think some people assumed it worked this way and played it this way. I think some people understandably uh, read it and worked it another way. Uh, and it's nice to have a definitive answer. And I, I don't know if there's a ton more to say about that. Agree. All right. Uh, so there's been an update to the core rules. Uh, this is objective card types. Uh, change the fourth and fifth sequences under surge objective cards and the surge step to read uh, when the condition on a surge objective card is met, the player may reveal that card. Uh, once revealed, they will score that card in the next surge step. So the change here is the word may. And there used to be an FAQ entry that from the last FAQ that we received that said this was a must. So you, we've now seen the removal of that FAQ and this um, core rule updated to a may. Yeah, uh, so basically for cards like Carve a Path, where you try and achieve something, but if you can go a stretch goal, uh, you can score two glory instead of just one. So previously it was if you achieve this without reaching the stretch goal, you still had to score it for the one. Now you have the option to hold it in your hand and kind of, uh, you know, you get the... Uh, one in the hand is worth two in the bush type uh, di dilemma. So the player agency here is increased. Uh, you sure. can risk it and go for more. And, you know, I think the player agency factor is important, but I also think like this is unenforceable in the other way, you know? Yeah. Like there's, there's no way for your opponent to look at your hand and say, Hey, you had to have scored that. So I think this is uh, unequivocally the only way you could have done this. Agree. And this is as long as I've been playing underworlds, uh, this is how I always, processed surges i would have to i didn't dive back into like an old rule book before uh jumping on the episode today but i believe it used to be written in this fashion like as long as i've been playing um surges have been a may and um i i echo what you both said um if turning into a must can really be hard at a tournament level to kind of enforce um uh, both within the game as well as like having a to come over um, to, to address like a must scenario. And then, um, I, I really like the player agency that's here, both in like, um, you're, you know, responsible to meet your conditions and score your surges, as well as the fact that you have the choice to hold them. Um, I, I really, really like that. Yeah. Speaking to the TO perspective, we, and we will see this kind of a thing. If you would have scored and you miss it and you're going into like the power step, and then you realize, oh, I should have scored this. Uh, the opponent does have the uh, the ability to say, like, you missed your opportunity. I, you were holding onto it, or you know, you you chose May and decided not to, and now you're d going back on your decision. So we'll we'll probably see that come up. Um, but I feel like if the surge doesn't have the stretch goal uh, condition on the card, it's kind of like come on that like it, there's no point in holding on to it longer um but uh stuff like uh what's the hexbane proof of guilt mm -hmm. yeah um, having that, scored six objectives yeah so like if you're a hexbane player they they might try and call you on that and try and keep that surge in your hand for a bit longer um so just got to be mindful of your surges and when they need to score and when they need to come out of your hand. Yeah. And uh, just a note on sportsmanship. Uh, if the game state hasn't changed, like um, there's so much going on in this game. I, I would encourage all players to um, continue in the spirit of the game and in the sense that they let people score what they accomplished if there's you know a quick oh hey i had this in my hand i would really like to score this you know sort of a deal and it doesn't seem egregious um then and most of the time i don't think it's going to seem egregious and, and uh frankly uh i could see this being one of the reasons why it was must for a minute here is yeah. to make sure that people are getting the glory for um you know what they've accomplished in the game 
Um, but at the same time, I'm really happy to see it become uh, a May again because uh, of all the reasons stated. Uh, I think it, it adds player agency. Um, but let's just uh, let's not be dicks. <laughs> yep. Second that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> On to the next one. Uh, Void Curse Thralls. Uh, only a few more left uh, here in the errata section. Uh, this, uh, again, is in the fixed camp. Uh, so this is uh, changing the third sentence on the plot card uh, in Void Curse Thralls to read, Void Curse Fighters cannot make actions other than move, attack, stun actions, or barge and charge super actions. Um, I think this is a pretty straightforward change here. They just uh, wanted to make sure that... Um, barge and charge well okay so charge is the straightforward aspect to me like move and attack was there before and i saw arguments for well it doesn't say you can charge when you're void cursed and it's like okay i'm sure that was the intent (laughs) yeah Uh, even though charge is made up of move and attack and uh, again this is an unintended consequence uh i think of defining super actions to state um they are not actions because right. I've also seen this come up. People are asking, does this mean the Void Curse fighter can't make a scything attack? Um, but I feel like charge is an elective action. Um, scything is part of the attack action. So Yeah, yeah. I saw, uh, I saw one of those um, discussions in our Discord, and Lathanum um, was hot on the case and showcased that scything is a keyword and kind of brought all the scything information forward. Um, so yep. I, I think it's it's pretty pretty good to say that scything um, is intended to, to work here and uh, probably rules is written um, works uh, uh, good and clear uh, here. Um, yeah, but stun and things... barge are new additions to this card. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it does also... Um, we can infer a little bit here, but Lathanum did bring up all the precise wording, but it is one where the game and all the text is going to get very wordy if we have to spell out every single thing whenever a card is coming out. Sure. Like every single use case. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, uh, an FAQ document can be daunting or or a rule book with you know those those extra pages because they had to make sure the um you know fine print was was perfect um can be daunting i know other games have um i forget what the term is chop was telling me about this they have a judge document where like if there's anything ambiguous um that isn't in the rule book it will be defined in the judge document. And so like, that's the daunting document, but you don't need to read it unless um, like you need to find the answers to those niche interactions or you're a TO. Gotcha. Um, Which, yeah, maybe maybe could be something um, uh, that we see adopted at some point. Um, Maybe not. I think we call that the previous season design commentary. (laughs) I think you're right. (laughs) Uh, All right. So, um any anybody uh impressed uh surprised to see stun and barge here or yeah stun and barge nope. uh nope still haven't used them yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I i was sitting here thinking of use cases i was like ah, i can actually think of some times where i wish i would have done that you know where i where i took gore hulk's choking grasp attack and i was like you know it would have been better just to get guaranteed because i was just doing it to try to stagger somebody it's like i had a guaranteed stagger there if i wanted it whoopsie <laughs> whoops yeah uh, but it is cool to see them added into like void curse thralls option like they're rare sure. enough as it is um that it's nice to see that they're not furtherly restricted uh, into into further rareness yep. uh yep. all right so uh we're going to cover two more errata here. And this is the errata in full. Uh, it was kind of a goal going into the episode that we would for sure cover each thing that, um, you know, it doesn't work the same way uh, as you read today. Um, yeah. And so with Breakneck Slaughter, uh, we've got another change that hits three cards uh, all at once. And uh, Headlong Sprinter, Living Hurricane, and Moving Mark. Uh, again, all breakneck slaughter have received uh, additional wording that says after this fighter's first move action in an activation step, uh, and then give this fighter one momentum counter. 
And so this used to say, uh, after the spider's move action, uh, give the spider uh, a momentum counter. Um, and one of these gives two. Um, but uh, regardless of how many momentum counters they give, um, I think the concern here was that you could have um, like move action combos. Like, mm. for example, um, I saw somebody talking about um, uh, the cutting crew. Yeah. How you could ha- technically have them running circles around um, the leader, uh, yeah. reacting off of each other, moving constantly, uh, and building up as much uh, momentum as they wanted. There was essentially a way to generate infinite momentum counters with the cutting crew. So <laughs> that feels like the most egregious example of this. Um, there may be others, but this is the most important one to um, note is that, hey, look, like this is not a way to generate infinite momentum counters. Yep. Agree. I, I like, I think that's an elegant change uh, is that it's after the first move action. I feel like most players playing Breakneck Slaughter won't like have to really register this change. Um, but those um, with multiple moves um, out there who thought that um, they could, you know, uh, push this further, uh, you, you'll be you'll be the one going. Oh wait, nope, uh, this change directly impacts me. So yeah, uh, stop it. Uh, the only other thing that uh, is important to note is that it uh, references an activation step. Uh, so this kind of cleans up the awkward. Hey, I took a move during the power phase, power uh, step. Oh um, yeah and generated these momentum counters and what do i do with these i guess they sit until the next you know which wasn't the worst thing in the world but this is just this is just a thing like hey we don't have these weird hanging momentum counters that build up uh, across from one power step into the next activation step so then the last one is for saxton of the <laughs> underworld's underground and that is a change to tangle briar from fearsome fortress uh this card change this card to read as follows place one available feature token in a hex within one hex of one or more friendly fighters the hex that contains that token is a snare hex in addition to other types this effect persists until the end of round so those unfamiliar with this card what it used to say was uh place one available snare token in a hex within one hex of one or more friendly fighters. And, and, and that was the end of it. Um, but uh, that makes this card um, useless <laughs> in uh, the current season because we don't have any snare tokens. And so uh, it looks like the update uh, here was to make sure, hey, you can pull in an available feature token um, and then to retain you know, that them- uh, theme of the card, it looks like the... Um, they've added this persisting until the end of round effect uh, where the hex that contains that feature token is a snare hex in addition to its other types. This is cool. Uh, I like this. Totally. I think one fun note uh, I'll bring up here outside of just making this uh, playable uh, is that you can make a block hex, a snare hex now, um, the one that you bring in with Tangle Briar. So you can set up a fly trap, if you will. For the ghosts. <laughs> and say, <laughs> go ahead, fly through this block text. I dare you. You'll get snared on your way through it. That's cute. I like it. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you listeners for hanging out with us uh, over the errata. I hope that you found uh, all of these entries uh, worthwhile uh, to hear. Maybe um, we were able to add some insight uh, or maybe we were able to add a little bit of clarity um, to what exactly changed for you. Um, so with that, we're pretty deep into the episode. So uh, we might uh, cut some of this a uh, little shorter than originally anticipated. Uh, we are going to cover the FAQ entries and uh, what has been updated with the Relic format documentation, which uh is really mainly a change to the championship format here. Um, as a note, there are 52 questions and answers, 52 entries um, between the current season uh, designer's commentary and the previous season designer's commentary. So already in preparation for this episode, uh, we 
uh, decided that we were only going to cover a few of these uh, that we felt was worth highlighting, um, but would encourage you to um, jump into these documents, see if anything has changed um, that impacts you. Mm. Uh, so the first uh, thing that I want to cover uh, in the FAQ is just uh, an update that we were actually uh, talking about with Varklov, and that is um, an update to their abilities FAQ section. And overall, uh, I think we're going to see this section roll into the rule book at some point in time. I think that this is the most meaningful um, piece of the current season designers document uh, designers commentary is all of the question and answers that they have under abilities because they really clear up um, uh, any confusion. Like they have a section on each uh, and all and how to process um, when a you know one fighter is not able to meet the requirements of an each or all um, you know card ability. That's okay as long as at least one fighter um, can process that card, it's still resolvable. Um, so questions like that exist in, in there today. And they've added uh, one that I want to highlight uh, about um, when it is okay for a value to be zero when uh, you are choosing or picking up to a certain value of things. Uh, and the answer that they've given is uh, when required by a card to do something up to a value, the value can be zero unless the card requires you to push a fighter. In that case, the minimum value is one, since a fighter that is pushed cannot uh, end the push in the hex they started the push in. Um, and therefore, pushing a fighter zero hexes is impossible. Um, this has been something that has been at odds um, with um, like entries in the designer's commentary, as well as um, kind of the way the rule book has carved out when a push of zero is okay. Um, and uh, now we, we know handedly that a push of zero is never okay. Um, and I, th I really like that cleanup. Um, I know I, um, I was somebody who was, you know, taking advantage of the up to ruling before uh, and using like a push of zero when I would use um, the scattering push reaction in dousing limb. There it is. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, you'd scatter two and then you'd push along there. And I would think to myself sometimes I'd be like, you know what? Uh, I don't like anything that I rolled. I'm happier. I'm happier with a push of zero. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't push along uh, the hex at all. And so to see that you have to push up to zero or sorry, uh, up to one for it to qualify as a push, um, I, I think is, is really good here. Yeah, uh, I think a good cleanup and I think it helps us interpret many cards. Um, and almost all of them are corner cases, but sometimes they're very important corner cases. Agree. Um, so I think what we'll do for the, this section is, are there any FAQ entries um, uh, hosts that I'm currently highlighting uh, that you would like to uh, cover? Yeah, um, I, so I think this is a again another corner case, but I, I liked uh, uh, I liked time freeze because uh, there was just some fundamental things that were hard to understand about that. And this was the question was, can you clarify how I take two activations in a single step? Because we understand the activation to have an activation followed by reaction, inspire. Um, surge uh and how does that incorporate if i'm taking them back to back and it just says in the turn in which you would take two activations you would take an activation then play through a reaction step and inspire step and a surge step after that surge step you would immediately take another another activation um so fairly intuitive but uh good to have laid out I agree brian is there one you want to jump on yeah i'll call out the armor of ice um question if a fighter has the armor of ice upgrade and they are void curse what is this fighter's defensive characteristic answer was both abilities set the characteristic of the fighter so the modifier that most recently came into effect is the value used um a little bit of added note uh, probably later on is also if the fighter inspires that does not supersede uh that is the fighter stats it's uh it's what the basic characteristic is. So the order of sequence of upgrade matters most. Uh, 
yeah, so if a uh, fighter's been void cursed, especially by um, uh, what's the upgrade that can be given to them, that's going to take precedent. And then if you then add on armor of ice, then that now takes precedence. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that, so I added this to um, the FAQs to highlight because uh, we had not seen like um, too many cards in the meta that would modify characteristics uh, and then compete against each other. Uh, the ruling's always been there, um, uh, the modification section of the rule book. Um, but I, I think with uh, especially Void Curse Thralls, this has become really meta relevant um, to a lot of players out there as to how to process multiple things setting the characteristic. Um, through modification. And uh, I, I think it's just a, a good little refresher uh, to know that um, it's always going to be the latest thing. Um, and additionally, uh, if you put a plus one defense on, say, a Void Curse th uh, Thralls Fighter, you're going to actually get that. They're not going to be stuck at one um, block, but they're actually going to go up to two block. Yeah, tracks. One thing I'll jump in here for, because I, th I thought this was uh, uh, an interesting um, call out for f the final curse, is uh, if a friendly wizard casts final curse, which is a card in the Force of Frost deck, and the caster suffers backlash, what happens? Because uh, this is a card that is happening when a character is to, or a fighter is to be taken out of action, yeah. right? Fighters, fighters already dying. You know? <laughs> so it's like, well, wait, what would happen? Uh, and they've ruled uh, the damage dealt by the backlash takes the caster out of action and the spell now fails. they die faster. They die faster, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, which I really enjoy. You'll never take me alive, Capra, see? Call this die harder. <laughs> well, from the current uh, season, there was only one more... Uh, there was only one more that we highlighted here, uh, and that was uh, Freeze, Thaw, Finish, and Iari's Frozen Bonds. Uh, and the question is, can the block text tokens be placed in such a way as to ensure that there are no enemy fighters visible to the caster? Uh, and I, I, I definitely was guilty of when we first started playing with these cards, thinking like, oh, I can just put the block text here, and then I can you know, damage this fighter. The, on the other side of me, I've protected myself. Um, but the answer here is actually no. Um, is once um, once you've placed the block text token, you have to continue to have line of sight to be able to process the rest of um, the spell, um, which I think matches rules is written really well because I believe rules is written um, if a fighter is chosen by a spell, at the time they're chosen, uh, it has to, you have to have uh, line of sight, and so I yeah, think, that's I, correct. I think that's what's so going on here. This says two things. It says uh, one, if you want to be able to damage somebody or do whatever the effect is, you have to be able to see them in order to choose them, and then two, uh, even if you didn't want to do that part, um, you have to be able to do it. Like you can't partially resolve this spell, which is in keeping with the way they've judged things in the past. Uh, agree. Uh, so then to kind of wrap out our FAQ section here, um, there were 17 entries of the 52 I mentioned present in the previous season FAQ. Uh, and I grabbed four of those that I thought, uh, would be fun to highlight. Uh, so, uh, Brian, do you want to take one of those? Yeah. Relevant to me. Uh, can a Void Curse Fighter make the resist action on false upgrades from the Thricefold Discord? No, you are stuck with it. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me want to do Void Curse Thricefold uh, in a <laughs> major way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that laugh because it makes me feel like I'll see it at LVO and I am scared. Yeah. Well... <laughs> We know we know for sure Brian is uh, you know um, testing Thricefold Discord hard. Yeah, uh, I imagine um, that's you know we'll be seeing him play some flavor of that. TBD. TBD. Who knows what he's uh, what he's decided is preparing? Licks microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Rose. Uh, yeah. What else? We got uh, Hexbane's hunters here. Um, 
this is uh, also a void curse thing. So like you, if you use price of victory, can I use that reaction to give an enemy fighter the singular reshaping upgrade? Yes. That's kind of cool. Um, I, I, we saw some very good players pioneer that deck at, uh, worlds. Um, and, uh, I really like thinking about that option. That's super cool. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I wouldn't have thought it worked that way because price of victory is worded in such a way where it's like, um, choose a, choose a friendly fighter, um, to place the upgrade on. But, um, this is such a fun ruling to like let, so like you pick singular reshaping as the upgrade you're choosing. And then like you kind of let the, the wording of singular shaping overtake, um, you know, price of victory and allow you to, to pass it over to your opponent. I yeah. Think, I think that's fun. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of fun, uh, mass poisoning. Uh, can I score this objective if a fighter with any poison upgrades makes two successful attack actions in the same phase, but did not have any poison upgrades for the first of those attack actions? Yes. Uh, I like this a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's as uh, it read to me, um, but it kind of sets a precedent for, uh, for that wording for us. Um, and it, it's cool to know that um, you can first get a successful attack action off uh, with a fighter before then committing a poison upgrade to that fighter to try for that um, second successful attack. I, I like that quite a bit. Uh, and uh, you know what? I broke the, I broke the chain of Void Curse Thralls there. Uh, <laughs> David, do you want to grab the last Void Curse Thralls ruling that we're highlighting? Yeah, I can do that. This is uh, involuntary interdiction. Can I score this objective during an enemy fighter's attack action, which I played reshaping demise? If the effect of the reshaping demise made the enemy attacker void cursed, this is like, did somebody use void curse to kill somebody? Uh, and it's an order of operations thing. Like, did it matter that they were void cursed before or after? And this is saying it only matters that they were void cursed after that attack action. So you can get yourself killed, void curse a fighter, and get your, hey, somebody void cursed killed somebody yeah this one doesn't feel super intuitive to me but i mean it adds more uh value to the card well i think i think it has to do with the tape uh timing of reshaping demise fighter slash is a void cursed fighter they blow up they void curse the killer and now it counts retroactively that yeah it's because reshaping demise is... that's what i mean is yeah. it doesn't feel in, intuitive uh but eh more versatility for the card and more value i think um, yeah reshaping demise by ha by uh, definition has to kind of check before that fighter is actually removed from the board so you can check adjacency and all that sort of thing so i think rules is written it actually makes sense yeah it doesn't a, doesn't feel too unintuitive to feel bad in my opinion either it, it feels like uh doubling down on that trap card because you don't know if they have reshaping demise in their hand. And it's like, ah, oh, they got me with reshaping demise. I'm void curse now. And they're like, and thank you. Uh, your void curse fighter, uh, or your now void curse fighter also killed somebody. So <laughs> I'm going to get a glory from that. It's like, no. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, all right, cool. Well, that wraps up um, the FAQ entries uh, that we wanted to highlight. So, um, just to reemphasize again, there are so many of these out there. Um, so many of them are, are targeted, uh, towards, um, like war bands or, um, even, uh, specific cards found within uh, the universal rivals decks. So, uh, I think it's just uh, worth reading up on, you know, the war band that, uh, you play and, and the universal rivals deck you're pairing them with just to go see, uh, if there have been any clarifications, uh, there for you. And, uh, the last piece that we're going to talk about here is championship. And um, there are three takeaways to the changes that we've seen to the document here. Um, and again, housed in the relic document, uh, there isn't a championship specific document these days. It's listed as a variant variant within the relic document. So if you're looking for it, you got to go there. Um, but, um, We've had a new FAR um, that we're going to dive into a little bit, uh, give you our broad thoughts on. We've seen the board rotation 
um, added the same board rotation uh, that is present in Rivals and Nemesis um, has been re-added to Championship, uh, which I'm super glad to see. And uh, lastly, Far Striders and Sepulchral Guard, um, their new decks um, that we see today uh, are the only valid decks for those warbands. And this is now true in all formats. It was true in Rivals and Nemesis before, but now it's true in all of Relic, including Championship. Yeah, it would would have just been messy any other way. Agree. Um, these are huge changes uh, to Championship, Far Striders and Sepulchral Guard being um, the least uh, uh, impactful here. Um, but uh, board rotation being added back, uh, there was uh, a period of time here where that has been the Wild West. And all boards uh, have been available for championship, which is not what that format used to um, like have. Uh, it, that format used to follow um, this two-year rotation of boards. Uh, so to see that in line with the rest of the game is awesome. Um, and that far, uh, Brian, uh, I'm going to have you kick us off on anything you'd like to talk about uh, rearing the far. Uh, claim the prize came off. That's big. <laughs> Healing potion came off. That's really big for counter ping. Love that. Uh, and then just to finish out the removals, uh, shifting madness from Grimwatch. Not familiar with that does. And the great plan for stalkers. So hold objective uh, back in a big way. It feels. Yeah, uh, I. I agree. One of one of the things regarding the removals that I'm really happy to see, uh, and I know I know there's going to be others out there who um, are happy to see this. They now actually uh, highlight the removal in magenta and put a strike through line through it. Oh um, man, so <laughs> that's <good>. so nice. <laughs> so there's no more like like comparing it to the previous list, which hopefully you saved because you can't download it uh, like from their front page anymore. And it's like trying to compare like what was and wasn't from before. It's just, uh, Hey, check this out. We are, uh, you know, highlighting its removal instead of just dropping it out. (laughs) Very happy for that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess diving more into the far, um, there are uh, now today, three total objectives um, that are restricted. uh, And there are now 28 total power cards that are restricted. And I was super curious. I had to look. I actually keep a record of all of the FAR changes since I started playing. Uh, It was kind of my way to give myself an easier view uh, of the FAR. And then they've just been accumulating next to each other, uh, which has been nice. Um, But uh, I, I had to go look is this the most amount of power cards we've ever had restricted? Mm, Interesting. And the answer is yes. Doubt it. Okay. Really? Uh, The uh, second highest is 27, and that was back in Dire Chasm, May uh, of 2022, 21. (laughs) Words. (laughs) Um, So the most amount of power cards we've ever seen restricted, which... I think is wild. It doesn't feel that way because yeah. um, you, we have all these like plot cards. Um, yeah. Like, I, like, I, yeah. I think it's a combination of plot cards. And in the past, they were very reluctant to restrict uh, faction upgrades. Uh, and I, I'm reaching way into the past here. Uh, but uh, for the original far list and for some quite some iterations after that didn't never included any faction things. Uh, and so here's the thing is like if your total number is, uh what you said 28 yes but 20 that's universal i left factions out of it uh, you got me all right never mind <laughs> well, i mean i think we can say as a podcast like we have really been focused on nemesis because it's been conducive to growing our local uh community uh it is uh for whatever your opinion is uh better or worse i think we like it but uh it, it is what GW's main events are what the green clashes have been. And so that's been our focus here. You know, as we, as we hear build up for LVO or Adepticon, we've been building nemesis of decks, uh, which takes our attention away from championship. Uh, but I think one of the best indicators is, uh, as Brian alluded to very early in the episode is, uh, we look at the Austrian masters and what a diverse 
uh, field they had there. Uh, war bands that we haven't seen competing in quite a while were were represented in that. Um, and uh, I, I think the feedback there was extremely positive. Like it, it has really opened up what uh, what is available to the championship meta um, uh, based on this uh, restricted list. So I think the, the combination of erratas and the far list for championship has uh, been a good thing for that, which is great because that's a really, it's a really strong part of the game overall. Yeah. One of the things last, well, previous seasons when it was all universals and it was all championship is they kind of struggled to kind of, gate the um, universal cards and we ended up seeing a de facto gating almost like a early version of rivals with like hunger decks or just magic um, hunter quarry mechanics and so for it, it was interesting because like for a while I wasn't playing any factions that didn't deal at all with hunger and so that was a whole section of the card pool that just I didn't even contemplate um, with Nemesis, it's gated into these decks. Um, and so you you consider each of them. I look at these cards far more than I ever did the Hunger cards. Uh, even Passive Prophecy or Beastbound Assault, I look at them far more often than I ever did the Hunger decks uh, or the Hunger cards. Uh, I'd be curious to see from a champ's perspective, like uh, with plot locking, you, you only get one of those. Uh, everything else is still up for grabs which of the plot locked decks has the most restricted cards in it uh which one's the most powerful um i find it of note like there's quite a few force of frost here but notably there's no abyssoft's avalanche on the restricted list so it looks like meta watch was being measured here and not just uh smacking it with the restricted after seeing what they were already doing to it so i think that's really interesting because it is going to be a challenge to pull it off as feared uh, and not further restricting it to make it that much harder. I think if it was restricted in champs, it just wouldn't be there. Yeah. It might as well be forsaken at that point. Yeah. Um, Very interesting. But yeah, it is, it is kind of like stepping back into the champs world and being like getting reacquainted with it. I'm like, I can't, I don't know how much I can speak to uh, the championship meta, but I'm excited uh, that um, we have this uh, to like really keep in mind as we build towards Adepticon. Uh, so if you're joining us in uh, you know a little over two months uh, at Adepticon, the what the hex uh, 32 player one day event is going to be championship, and so we have this far uh, uh, to like uh, reshape the meta, you know, going into that, uh, which uh, as pointed out, you know, we're seeing. Uh, immediately with the Austrian Masters event, the top eight warbands there, all unique. Not a single duplicate. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I I can't wait to see, you know, over the course of a few months or a couple months here, you know, what people, um, what people bring to Adepticon. I, I'm, I'm so pumped. Yeah. I mean, I think these, I think these impacts have, we didn't get into some of the wider ranging things, but I think, I think even just like something as simple as like clipping back Abyssos Avalanche, like really gives Horde Warbands outside of Hexbane room to breathe. Uh, and so LVO comes around. I'm, I'm kind of terrified of Kanan's. I'm terrified if somebody uh, is able to really flex some of these war bands, which I haven't had to think about in a little while because they've been, uh, they've been pushed off to the periphery. Um, ter- terrified and excited, I guess is, is, is the right way to say it. Yeah. If I were to um, kind of try to like read the tea leaves on this far change here, uh, we can see that they've added four more pings to the restricted list. Um, and, uh, beyond that two more pings, if you're looking at like the faction cards, um, uh, mm-hmm. bolts of Zinch being hit in Ephilim, soul slice shards being hit in thrice fold. Um, and the, the ping meta was super prevalent, um, in championship because everybody had, um, such access to all of these, you know, one or two offs that would be present in a nemesis deck, um, you know, them being mostly wide open, 
uh, in championship. Um, I noticed uh, like unbearable energies, you know, isn't one of the pings that was hit. And I think that's probably pretty intentional um, because that lives under a plot card today. So Mm -hmm. there's kind of a tax to bringing that that doesn't need to be uh, an R slot, you know, a tax. Right. Um, So you know, kind of like a, a big picture, you know, tea leaf reading here, we're seeing that, uh, you know, ping was identified as something that needed to be restricted. Um, and we're also seeing with the, like the remove of claim the prize, um, shifting madness, um, which by the way, Brian, um, I was curious too. Uh, that is, um, I can tell you it's a surge for holding the same objective number as the round number. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of hold objective help. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, with the removal of those, um, or, or the addition of, uh, hidden layer, um, which is an extremely impressive card to a hold war band. Um, it looks like another element of this change is to breathe some more life uh, back into the hold game plan. Yeah, love it. I really dig it. And, and I'm going to open this up beyond the championship far uh, that we've uh, just been highlighting here um, and kind of start winding us into you know the end of the episode here. Is there anything uh, that you guys would like to talk about regarding um, the change as a whole? Uh, where are you feeling regarding, um, you know, all of this change uh, and how it's going to impact the game? Where where, where does it sit with you? Uh, From my perspective, we've had a chance to see what the online community reaction was uh, from these. And it's been, I mean, it's been about as positive as I've seen anything in the community from this. Like it it is, uh, it's been good. Like, and there's a lot to be, uh, to pay attention here because like in the past, these things were always to address championship format. And here, what we're trying to do is look at championship and nemesis and relic and, uh, are not relic, uh, uh, rivals. Um, and that that's a lot to cover in one document. And I, I feel like the folks who worked on this did a, a, a really solid job. Um, uh, and that's not to say that, this is at first glance perfect. Like I, I, I think there's so much information. There's so many things going on in this game. It's so hard to figure out like whether a particular change will be adequate or overkill or, or whatever. But uh, I think, uh, I think this is a shift in the game that is akin to, you know, another impactful war band or rivals deck or both uh, dropping as a release. Uh, and I think that's great. Um, we've often said on this podcast how much we think the game is healthy when it is in flux and people are figuring new things out. Uh, and and I think that's that's in place right now. Uh, on top of just like making sure people understand how some core fundamentals of the game work, like we don't end up with some some question marks. So I am a pretty unambiguous thumbs up on this uh, on this whole document set of documents, I should say. Yeah, I'm definitely big, big uh, double thumbs up on this. Uh, really enthusiastic. It, there was a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, some of us were wishing for a bit sooner, but I think we're overall satisfied with the results. Um, and I've, I've seen that online is really cool to see. Uh, optimism soaring feels great. Love to see that for the game. You know, it always sucks when the mood isn't great and that carries through. So this optimism helps us and everyone around the world build the game and the hype back up. Uh, I'm curious to see if like now that this backload has been done, how frequently we'll get these. I think at least regular intervals is ideal. Yeah. I think regular intervals will be key. Um, I don't know when we can expect the next one. Um, You know, I'd hope for quarterly. I think that's what uh, the larger game systems do. Uh, We may be, biannually or two a year i i'm hoping for four but um i'd be curious to see as we move on um is and perhaps this is a question to you guys and maybe the listeners get the discussion going like the meta watch and the uh seeing things develop it it can feel like a game of whack-a-mole a bit like i don't necessarily i like what we're seeing in terms of uh 
warbands that need to get nerfed getting nerfed but not getting obliterated um and it's like you don't always want to just stomp on the top performers if they're being performed but or if if they're performing well due to a really good pilot uh, i think skylar and i have talked about elethane soul raid being a challenging warband to pilot um and you don't see a lot of them because they are challenging and when they perform well it's deserved it's not uh, due to the warband necessarily being broken. Uh, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts what the next moles might be popping up will be. I mean, I think if you're so asking, far? if you're asking Bobby, it might be Gore chosen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was saying they're the, the new King of ping, which is, which is true as somebody who pilots Gore chosen. I'll say if you can find a way to uh, knock out um, Drom, then a lot of their ping is just uh, becomes salvage material, but right. And um, that's where I think there's a vulnerability there that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be on the chopping block. Yeah, uh, but it uh, remains to be seen. And I, I think like these uh, shakeups in the uh, in the meta are are valuable. Um, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll see where things develop from there. Agree. Okay. Yeah, listeners, listeners, let us know what uh, is your uh, what you think needs to be either toned down or toned up. I mean, there's plenty that needs to be turn- tuned up, but I think we're limited with older war bands, but at least they're willing to go back and do fixes like Kagra's here. So overall, I'm optimistic. I'm just trying to get thoughts flowing. Yeah. 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 Thoughts flowing. Um, it, I'm, I'm so curious as to where like the meta will shake out and like if somebody will kind of like um, peek their head above the rest and <laughs> need a good, good wallop uh, to bring them in line with the rest. Um, you I, said wallop, don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I, at the top of the meta, um, uh, I'd, I don't know. Uh, like in, within Nemesis, it's a, it's an easier read. Championship, uh, I think, is a super hard read uh, after such a big, um, uh, you know, uh, I was trying to find an elegant word for change up here. But like, you know, uh, we are going to have to see how how it all shakes out uh, when it comes in to championship. championship I love that we had in the top three, both one of the oldest war bands in Sepulchral Guard and one of the newest war bands with Siren Eyes Razors uh, in the top three. That was really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, if I had to, if I had to pin like uh, some culprits that I think are going to be um, towards the top of uh, like nemesis performance, uh, <laughs> I do think Mad Mob is up there. Uh, I also think Hexbane Hunters continues to be in that conversation. You and I savaged each other with them for some testing. We were, <laughs> uh, we wanted to prep for LVO and Void Curse Hexbane. Oh my god. They can do some brutal things if you uh, manage to make some lucky defensive saves. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's what, those would be the two that, that immediately come to mind for me. Uh, I feel Gortos and of Drom are very well positioned and very strong. Um, but with each of these, I don't know if they're too strong. Uh, like I think they sure like are in the conversation for being towards uh, the top of what's out there today in Nemesis. But um, I, I, I don't know if that's um, that's a power level that's um, like in an undesirable state. I would agree, and I really want to see what warbands make use of malevolent masks. Oh my gosh, so much so. Oof. Yeah, agree. Uh, and uh, to to wrap up uh, thoughts here, uh, I'll join your thumbs ups. Uh, we had one from Davey, uh, two from Brian. We'll give we'll give if anybody's seen Disney's Hercules, two <laughs> flaming thumbs up from Hades, <laughs> Hades over here. I'm just pleased as punched. I. And, and to speak to the community, I've, I can't remember the last time I've seen like such overwhelming positiveness following a change, an addition, you know, something new to the game. Uh, it's often divisive. And here it just felt like there was tons of celebration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's rare, but uh, it's awesome to see. 
Second Christmas. <laughs> Second Christmas. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Davey, would you take us out? Yeah, for sure. Uh, if you got thoughts about what we talked about here today, you can get in touch with us. That's at WTHCast on the site formerly known as Twitter, what the hexcast at gmail.com. Uh, or just come check out our content at uh, mortalrealms.com. That's for all the shows on our network. Uh, and then uh, a link to our Discord, which will also be in the show notes. Uh, that's where we do a ton of chatting with listeners. Uh, and if you want to do that, hop on. Uh, it's a friendly place to be. Uh, coming up is going to be LVO coverage. We are trying to figure out a way to uh, co- cover the pink slip game that Brian has so bravely uh, put it himself in for um, and has been pra- well I don't know practicing for to the exclusion of uh, actually practicing for the actual event I'm I'm almost equally practicing for LVO and the pink slip game all right fair enough uh, priorities priorities should be where they need to be um, we are, are we're going to try and figure out how to cover that but it's it's uh, there's some technical things that we just have never tried before uh, recording audio from uh from an event in a noisy environment video and and that sort of thing so if we get that out you'll know it because we'll we'll throw it at you otherwise uh, you can expect to hear from us in a couple weeks where we will have returned from lvo uh, and we'll have you uh some some degree of coverage um this is the part of the episode where i usually uh attack people with flavor text but uh i think i'm on the defense this time that you are. Are you two ready for the flavor text quiz? Not, not really. But uh, like, this feels especially challenging because it could be pretty wide open. I'm assuming it's something that's been errated or FAQ'd, but uh, go for it. It is indeed relevant to today's episode. Okay. And that is your hint. All right. All right. The flavor text reads the old one's vision for creation will not be denied. The great plan. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to be so rude as to interrupt you, but uh, I think you thought Phil was going to be on this episode. So. As you lose. <laughs> oh, I actually picked it when uh, Phil <laughs> couldn't make the episode. <laughs> to give, well done. I was hoping it would be a little bit more of a struggle. Uh, <laughs> But shout out, Phil. <laughs> yeah. And nice work, Brian. Tip of the hat to you there. The great plan it is. Um, right. And with that, uh, a recommended listening for you all. And this is Perfect Match by Saint Chaos featuring Royal Republic. Uh, this is my favorite song of 2023 uh, released within that year. And I think uh, the title, uh, Perfect Match, uh, is what we have here with the community and the new documentations. Bring it all together and have a blast. Awesome. Uh, For What the Hex, I've been Davey. And I've been Skyler. I've been Brian. that gold we're recording now (laughs) oh that's true (laughs) unfortunate what's the other oh i don't i think we maybe talked about this before i occasionally get like this uh like friction sound when you're talking i don't know if it's like your hands rubbing on something i I think that's what you had said once me um yeah but oh yeah i caress the mic all the time okay (laughs) 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 well (laughs) <laughs> well <laughs> slanish gonna slanish i guess is, so. is, is that a please don't oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think it's what makes the podcast really yeah that's fair it's our signature <laughs> move now so we'll we'll, uh, we'll stick with it so got it uh <laughs> premium content is i lick the microphone <laughs> oh boy <laughs> what the heck's after dark yeah. <laughs> um cool Delete all this stuff. Uh, should I?
how do I how do I jump back in there? Hmm. Okay. Uh, I torpedoed it. Uh, Brian had no, something to say, and I talked over him just to totally torpedo everything.